Let us pray. Gracious God, we are overwhelmed with your goodness. You've given us joy unspeakable. We have no words for what you've done for us. So we bow in our hearts to you to say thank you. Help us keep the Easter event going in our lives. Help us to approach each day and each hour with the hope of the resurrection. Help us to get out of our own way and the things that keep us from you. Teach us to learn the things you would have us learn and let go of the things that were no longer needed. We give you thanks for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when well, we keep you a few minutes uh, today, it's too good of a day to be uh, not out with other people and be with family members. He's risen. A couple of things going on here. Um, we encourage people to spend five minutes a day in the Word. It'll change your day. It'll set your day off right. The Bible says there's to delight in the world, word, meditate on it day and night. And so, five minutes at lunchtime, in, in the morning, while you're driving on a 405, anything you want to do, just spend five minutes of the word. In fact, we have a, a challenge this year. It's the pastor's challenge to read the Bible in a year. By December 31st, your name will be on a plaque forever. It'll be um, immortalized. And so, uh, join us in that reading. It takes... 72 hours, 72 hours. And here's the thing, you can do it, you can listen to it with an audio Bible, you can read it, you can do half and half. Sometimes getting through the, the Chronicles and, and Leviticus, maybe just to listen to it might be a little easier, but uh, whatever's gonna get you through, the combination is good, so. 72 hours, you can do it in a, in a couple weeks in the summer. You can get through that, start today, that's the challenge. Splash Camp. Uh, registration's open. You need uh, some weeks for your children in the summer to have some fun time together. Um, you can go online. There's postcards in the back that tell you how to get onto the website. And so that's a great event for the kids. We're doing this uh, process, Living the Resurrection 2025. And so um, a lot of you will be experiencing this from different members of the congregation in different ways. So just be aware that that's going on. We're in this journey to get to 2025. It's not a destination, but it's a journey where God would have us go. And so we're looking for God to help us make this place what he would want it to be. Um, we're looking to, in our own lives, what's God up to now in our lives? We know the past 500 years were about the Reformation, but now what is God up to? We're looking for God's guidance in our lives to lead us into the future. So we have this... Uh, book study that we're doing together, um, Good and Beautiful God. Um, James uh, Byron Smith, you can catch up with that if you get it. It's a, it's a very small book, but it's profound. We'll be doing um, chapter six in about two weeks. So if you want to read that over the, over the holidays, um, catch that on Amazon or something. And Good and Beautiful God, we'll be carrying that forward, chapter six coming out. Our vision, of course, is to help Christians to be Christians. No decision required. All over America today in churches, at the end of the service, they will be inviting people to come forward and make the decision for Jesus. And that's cool. That's, you know, if that's that, the tradition of these people to do that, that's fine. The only thing is, God has decided for us before we were born. He's made a decision for us that he loves us and we can never escape his love. No matter what we do, we can't make him unlove us. As far as he's asserts, the decision's been made. When Jesus died on the cross for us, the decision was made. His love stands firm, and it can never be erased. 
Holy Week takes us through the narrative of Jesus, and it coincides with Passover, coincides with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days. And so we're seeing and remembering that Jesus was Jewish, is Jewish, will always be Jewish. We're a bunch of people following a Jewish God. Nothing has changed for that. And we've been invited in to this relationship. Judaism is not a religion, it's a relationship. Same way that being a Christian is not a religion, it's a relationship that we've been invited into. And so we find that relationship in God's Word. I've got a new Bible, and this is a 17-point type. It's better than my 14-point type, so you can really, I don't even need to get glasses anymore. 17-point is pretty easy, even I can read that. So, Jolene read to us this event of the women who were running to the tomb that morning. They wanted to be there to anoint the body of Jesus, and they get there, and the stone has been rolled away. And so then Peter's invited. And I put up the, uh, actually the Jewish translation of what is being said here, because it's a little bit more precise. It says, Kepha, which is Peter, rock, got up and ran to the Kiva the tomb. And when he bent over, Kiva sees that the linen cloths were only there. And he departed, wondering to himself, with Torzich Inum, unresolved puzzlement. So he leaves with unresolved puzzlement about the thing that has just happened. He goes running to the tomb, sees the grave clothes there, and so in his mind, it's unresolved puzzlement. What would you think? What would you think if you got there? And the tomb is empty and the clothes are there. Unresolved puzzlement. So he's thinking to himself, what? I feel the same. Nothing's changed for me. Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God. Everything looks the same. There's nothing different. What does he mean? He's been talking about being born again. Talking about being the Messiah. I don't feel any different at all. I'm kind of like same old Peter. What's up with me? What happened? Nothing different. What about us today? Might come here and have a great time and have a nice breakfast, see some old friends, but then has anything changed? Is something supposed to change? Are we supposed to see something? I think the answer is yes. The old Peter runs to the tomb, and the new Peter sees nothing. It's an empty tomb, he sees nothing. And God calls us to see this nothingness. There's nothing there. He invites the whole world to come and look and see nothing. There's nothing there. Take a look here. to Jerusalem to see this magnificent church that surrounds the empty tomb. But when you go in the tomb, you don't see anything because there's nothing there because God has called us to see nothing. Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He is risen. He's not here. 
but the nothing is something because it turns into something, doesn't it? We can take it off our to-do list because Jesus has risen, which means we have risen. We don't have to die anymore. We can take dying off our to-do list, that nothing is not going to happen. Dying is a nothing thing, and we can take that off our list because we will be raised with Jesus. When we're going down the road, we don't have to worry about our destination because we're in Christ. We can go down a road that says absolutely nothing, but we know we are in Christ because Christ lives in us so that nothing becomes something. He is the king of nothing unless he becomes the king of our hearts. Then that nothing becomes something. Jesus becomes our king, our Lord and Savior, that nothing changes into something. John writes it this way, and this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this is the life is his son. He that has the son has life, and he that doesn't have the son doesn't have life. Pretty simple. And these things I've written to you that you believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and you can believe in the son of God. We have eternal life, we have something our nothing has been changed into something. We have eternal life with Jesus forever. And what does that mean? What does that eternal life mean? What does it mean now that our sins have been forgiven? We've got a clean blank slate. So what do we do with that? How do we live now? Because we don't want to go back and muck it up. So how do we live? What are we supposed to do? Or do we live in like Peter, perpetual puzzlement. I think God wants us to do something. These are the Ten Commandments. We may have forgotten about these a long time ago. Maybe we think they belong to the Jewish people or not. I assure you, it's what God wanted us to always have and live by. When Jesus came, he came to give us these commandments, to teach us these commandments. He didn't come to erase them. He wanted us to keep them. They fit together. There's five that have to do with God and five that have to do with us around two tablets. He could have reduced the font and actually put them on one, but he wanted to make it two for a specific reason because they fit together like, well, better than OJ's glove, I tell you that. They fit together tight, the left and the right. For us to, what does it say in Jeremiah? The new covenant is he's gonna write his laws in our heart. What laws? These laws. Now, when you get a new car, you don't say, Man, I'm glad I got this new car because now I can drive on the left-hand side of the road. I don't have to stop for any stoplights and no more parking tickets. New car means same laws, same rules of the road. Well, God has given us a new covenant, but not one to keep out here, one to keep in here. It's the same laws, it's the same rules. Jeremiah says, God will put them in our heart and we can live by them. What laws? The same ones. The only ones that ever mattered, the Ten Commandments. Because that is how to have a relationship with God through the Ten Commandments. That's why he gave them to us. He goes, this is what I'm about. If you want to know me, come and see. There's no other rules. This is how we know God, through his word, through his commandments that he gave Moses. What are they? You remember them. Know the gods before me. Don't make any graven image. Do not take his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Do not kill. No adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. And they fit together. They fit together like this. His and ours. The Ten Commandments make five principles that rule the universe. Five principles that rule the universe, Ten Commandments. These are the laws that he writes in our hearts. So now we can live a clean slate, resurrected life, and we know how to live. They're the sails that go on our boat. They will get us through this life. They will teach us how to live with God and live with one another. And they're perfect. There's only 10. 
That's what God has given us. That's what Jesus died for, so we could wipe the sight clean, so we don't have any fear of death, and now we could live a new life. What kind of life? The life that he came to show us. A godly life, so we'd have a relationship with God. The Ten Commandment kind of God, not a different kind of God. This is the kind of God that Jesus is one with. As so we learn how to walk through life, we learn how to teach our children these, we learn how to model these behaviors. It sounds old, it is kind of old. They're over 3,000 years old, but they're eternal. And that's why we gather, that's why we model these for our children. This is how we live. Paul writes, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Does our faith make the law void? Paul says, no way. We establish the law through our faith. We establish the law through our faith. Don't take away the law. Jesus says, don't think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not here to destroy it. I'm here to fulfill this. Finally, one more time, Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under the grace? God forbid. That's what grace is about. Grace means our sins have been forgiven, not to go out and go have a sin party. The other disciples says, hey, we won, we're the winners now. Let's go light some camels on fire. Let's go through town and, and I don't know, rob some pottery. What are you gonna do back then? Stay within the law. It change the behavior. So Peter's feeling himself and says, anything different? No, nope, nothing's different. But my sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. That's what's different. I don't feel the burden of guilt anymore and shame. I kind of feel light. A little, little light now. My sins are forgiven. And I actually feel better. That's how we're supposed to feel. That's how we're supposed to see it. This is the covenant that we will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts. On their minds, I will write them. So we have this in it. We have these guiding principles in our life. It's what we live by. So we walk through life. That's, it's, it's, the Ten Commandments are an island of sanity in an insane world. If you want them. If you want them. What do we know? Whatever we do, Jesus loves us. He's a shepherd. We are a sheep. And that's forever. What's different? Our sins are forgiven. We're not the black sheep anymore. We're not the prodigal sons. We are his beloved sons and daughter. And that's what makes Easter different. Jesus has become our Passover lamb. He's died for our sins and we are set free. Let us stand. Let us say our memory verse together for 2019. It's up on the screen here. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.